Hello, Mike. Thank you. And a welcome to you too. Uh, this is BibleBase.com in conjunction with uh, NewLifeRadio.co.uk uh, bringing you another episode of Broken Bread. I'm Ron Bailey from BibleBase.com and we are tonight we're doing study 17 and we've been looking to this is our title to the churches of Galatia. So we're looking at Paul's letter to the Galatians as it's usually called and we've been working our way through it. We've not got too far through it. We've got about not quite halfway through it yet. Tonight is number 17. But I'm taking the opportunity just to to ramble through it. In the old days when Mike and I used to work together on New Life Radio um, on a campsite, um, I used to have a morning session that people began to call Ron's Rambles. Because what I would do is I would, I would kind of play music and then talk about it and think about it and join it into the next piece of music. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. And those were known as Ron's Rambles. And this is a little bit of a ramble, but it has a definite destination in sight too. Now, last week uh, we were looking in the letter to the Galatians. And in the last study, if you didn't miss it, please do try and catch up. These studies now, incidentally, are available on Mike's New Life Radio .co .uk. He has an archive section, and you'll find the previous 16 and tonight's 17th studies there as well. I also have a podcast called Bible Based Podcasts. You'll find these there too. We also have a, um, a website called BibleBase.com, and there you can get not only the audio voice, but you can actually get uh, a video um, as well of these things. And uh, I, I don't know where else it goes, but um, I, I pray that God will just continue to publish these things that he puts into our hearts. So in the last study, we spoke about what I called the Calvary baptism. And I said that at Calvary, Jesus Christ was baptized into what we had become as a consequence of Adam's sin. And I quoted a wonderful quotation from James Denny, where he said, Death is the curse of the law. It is the experience in which the final repulsion of evil by God is decisively expressed. And Christ died. In his death, everything was made his that sin had made ours. Everything in sin, except its sinfulness. I really think that is a profound statement. And I want to pursue it a little bit, about this identification of Jesus Christ with the human race and our identification with him, not just as a theory, not just as part of that notion of standing and state and those kind of things, but I want to pursue this idea of God uniting himself in his son to us and what we had become so that ultimately he could unite us with him in his son, having taken away the first that he might establish the second, making a new creation. If any man be in Christ, Paul said he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So I want to think a little bit about that. And uh, here's a question. This isn't a frivolous question. How many nails were nailed into that cross at Calvary? Just think about it for a moment. How many nails? Well, the accusation against him was written on a placard over his head. So we won't count that one. So I think probably one for each hand and one that impaled both feet. So three nails. The reason I mention that is because I want to read a passage to you from Colossians. And this is why I've called tonight's session Nailed It. Nailed It. Maybe you remember an old Graham Kendrick song called Pay It on the Nail, which 
which was uh, is still one of my old favourite. This is Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 11 to 15. I won't give you time to um, catch up now because I know some people listen to these podcasts in cars and things. But um, if you can listen to this at another time, please find Colossians chapter 2, 11 to 15, because I'm going to read it now. This is what Paul writes to the Christians at Colossae. I'm going to say more about the Christians at Colossae shortly. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. These aren't easy things to understand. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead and you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. Now listen to this little phrase. Having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now then, he has taken something out of the way, we'll go back to it in a minute, he's taken something out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So, is that another nail? And just what was nailed to the cross? Well, let me quote you Danny again. Death is the curse of the law. It is the experience in which the final repulsion of evil by God is decisively expressed. And Christ died. In other words, the final repulsion of evil by God decisively expressed was experienced as Christ died. In his death, everything was made his that sin had made ours. Everything in sin, except its sinfulness. So, what was this that was nailed to the cross? And how? Well, Paul gives us a little list here. Having forgiven you of all your trespasses having wiped out the handwriting. Let's take this bit by this. There's some amazing pictures in here. In the days of the New Testament, when it was written, writing was done with, a, with, something, with something called black. And it, it didn't, wasn't an ink like ours that sometimes has an acid in it which eats into the paper. It was made from kind of soot and other things like that. It was very black. But it did kind of wear over time and people then had to re-ink them or re-black them. So when it says the handwriting, it, it's talking at one point about something that can be wiped out. Because with those documents, whether they were on vellum or even if they were on papyrus, if you kind of took a, a damp rag or something like that, you could actually literally wipe it away. And you can't do that on your printed page. And you can't do that on modern things that have been written in ink which you could in the ink that was used in New Testament times. You could actually wipe it out. And in fact, they did. In the way that artists sometimes uh, paint over another, an older painter with, and, and do a kind of another one over the top of it, that was often done with documents. Vellum, which came from the calf of an, the skin of animals, that was very expensive. So if you'd got something that wasn't being used or that you didn't think was really important, uh, you could wipe it out, and you call that a palimpsest. <laughs> um, you wiped it out, and you wrote something of more importance over the top of it. But here, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out, so something here has been wiped out. In this death that he died upon the cross, somehow something was wiped out. Well, yes, sins were wiped out, certainly. The record of them was wiped out. And he says here, the handwriting. Now, this word for handwriting is a fascinating 
um, illustration because uh, it really refers to something like an IOU. If if I borrowed some money from you and uh, I said, yes, I'll pay you back on Friday, uh, you might say, well, can you give me an IOU, IOU or something like that? Um, and I would write out an IOU, so it would be in my handwriting. Uh, I might it might have my signature on it, and I would I would give it to you, and that would be my IOU. And uh, this really means a memorandum of a debt. It, it's it is really an IOU. It's it's used in public and private contracts, and it's a technical word that's used often in the Greek papyri. And um, so here we go. Then he's wiped out. An IOU of requirements. Now, the requirements really is kind of ordinances or the thing that was required of us. And then he says uh, here, uh, it was against us. Now, I want you to notice something. You probably won't notice it if you're driving your car. But if you look at this, up until this point, Paul has been saying we and we and we. And then suddenly in the midst of this sentence, he says, having forgiven you. All your trespassing, uh, trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Did you notice that kind of change of gear from having forgiven you to having out, right, wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us? So who is you and who is us in this thing? I think the us really is the whole human race in one level, but in particular, it is, it, it is something that was... A, against the people of Israel. Because just as Jesus' accusation was written over him on the cross, there is a sense in which all their failure of the Jewish people that God had bound them to by that extraordinary covenant he entered into, that was their debt. And in their agreeing to it three times, remember, three times they said, all that God has said we will do. Three times they said it. All that God has said we will do. All that God has said we will do. And I think I probably mentioned earlier that in Calvary, Jesus also committed himself three times to taking this cup, changing the metaphors, and drinking it to its bottommost uh, dregs. So he's this IOU, which in a sense, the Jewish people in particular have kind of signed with their own names and said, I have a debt for all these laws that are broken, because this covenant has built into it curses, and they are against us. It was contrary to us. And then it says, he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Well, if there were three nails in the cross, I hope this doesn't kind of upset you to say it like this, but one through the right hand or wrist, and one through the left, and one impaling the two feet together, which is usually how people imagine. Certainly this is how Roman crucifixions were usually done. And that's what we presume, that these are the nail prints in his hand. There were three of them. But here it says, he nailed it to the cross. Where does this extra nail come from? Of course, it was in himself that it was nailed to. It was in himself. Those nails not only nailed him to the cross, but because through the eternal spirit he'd offered himself without spot to God, he had become God's sacrifice and the victim, and that had upon him all the sins and all the curse. And now, as the goat, he is driven away into the wilderness, and also as the other goat, he dies under the curse. Extraordinary picture. Extraordinary picture. Maybe you know that on the cross, Jesus cried out, <clears throat> it is finished. And some people, when they read that, they may think, oh, well, that's it. Then he's, he's beaten. He's finished. It's, um, it's the end of the road. It was a wonderful dream, but it's all come to nothing. It's finished. But this Greek word, teleo, really means to bring something to... Um, the logical end, to finish a thing, to carry it out to the full. And the interesting thing is that sometimes instead of wiping out the IOU on those 
handwritten things. They would actually just write across it one word, Tetelestai. It is paid. It is finished. It is done. The exact words that Jesus cried from the cross. It's done. Yes, it's done. It's done. Yes, it's done. Through the precious blood of Jesus, the victory is won. Hallelujah. I am free. Hallelujah. He sets me free. It's to finish, to bring it to an end. And it frequently signifies not just terminating a thing, but carrying out a thing to the full. That's what Vine says. So this is an amazing thing. How, how does this impact upon us? How can we understand this? And now I'm going to get into some real deep water. I'm going to talk about epistemology. Mm -hmm. So um, what does that mean? Well, it's one of these big fancy words that uh, philosophers use. And it really means, in a sense, what, how do I know what I know? I want to talk tonight about how do I know what I know? Uh, do you recall some time ago during the previous American administration when Donald Rumsfeld on one point made this famous quote which left I think most of the reporters looking kind of somewhat baffled and a little bit concussed and he said this I've got a quotation here in front of me as we know there are known knowns there are things we know that we know we also know there are known unknowns that is to say, we know there are some things that we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The things that we don't even know that we don't know. Are you still with me? <laughs> well, most of those reporters weren't, I think. Now, I was with it because for three extraordinary years for me, um, I worked for an international bank at the turn of the century on the Y2K project. And this was one of our constant, long before Rumsfeld, but this was one of our slogans that we had to bear in mind all the time. What is it? Well, we know what we know. There are known knowns. But there are also things that we don't know. We know that we don't know them. So because we know that we don't know them, we can make some attempt at least to research them, to experiment with them, so that we can ultimately know those known unknowns that we didn't know. Are you still following this? <laughs> but how about this third lot here? That are unknown unknowns. Things that could really called disaster to the Y2K project. Not because we hadn't done what we knew we needed to do, but because we didn't know we needed to know to do some things. So, yep, there are known knowns. And there are known unknowns, but we can work on those. But there are also unknown unknowns, and we're completely in the dark with those things. You say, oh, this is just getting um, too complicated or too clever by half. Well, here's a, a quotation from John's first letter. And John refers often in his first letter to we know. We know. In fact, that little phrase, we know or don't you know, is used, I think, almost 50 times in the letters of the New Testament. It's a key thing. It's, it's one of these phrases that engages you and says now do you know what i'm talking about or, or as i would say are you with me do you know what we're talking about here okay let's work our way through this but now by this he says we know and then he says we know that we know so at the risk of boring you there are some things that we know and there are some things that we know that we know and john says how do we know how do we know that we know this is epistemology. How do we know that we know? John's answer is, because we keep the commandments. In other words, it's one thing to say, I know it. But if we really know that we know it. 
then we keep his commandments. It has an inevitable impact upon the way that we live our lives if we really know what we say that we know. I had an old friend, he's with the Lord now, but he would often say, often when Christians say, I believe, they really mean, I hope. When they really believe, they don't even say, I believe. They say, I know. John here takes it one step further. We know that we know. So some things that we know. Well, some things we know from personal experience. You can say, well, I was there. I know it because I was there when it happened. Or I've seen it as an eyewitness. So we know because of our personal experience. And some things that we don't know, some things that we don't know and we know that we don't know them, with some of those things, well, we can do something about it. We can research, we can try. And there are some things that we don't know, we don't even know that we don't know them. For those things, we need revelation. We need information from outside ourselves. We need somehow information to be brought to us that can give us a foothold, a beachhead at least, in beginning to know something else. And I want to talk to you about something that's really very important. And what I want to know, ask here is really what, because Paul says a lot of things about the Colossians. He says a lot of things about what he knows about them. And he knows some things about them that I think they didn't know about themselves. Okay, let's press on. He only knew Epaphras. Did you know this, that Colossians, Paul had never visited Colossians. They had never seen him and he'd never seen them. But Paul had a companion, a fellow servant, as he called him, named Epaphras. And he had been working with the church at Colossae and also with Hierapolis. And another one at a place called Laodicea that you may just know. Um, so what did Paul know about the Colossians? Well, let me work through Colossians quickly with you. Here's the first one. Here's a little list. He says this, Since we heard of your faith in Christ, and of your love for the saints. Now, the only way that Paul could have known that is because Epaphras has informed him. Epaphras has written to him, or he sent some message to him in some way, and Paul knows that these, these Colossian believers have faith in Christ, not faith in an idea, not faith in a notion or a doctrine, but they have put their trust, they put all their eggs in one basket, they put their trust in a person. Jesus Christ. He knew that because Epaphras had told him. And then in that same verse, it says, um, and of your love for all the saints. So Paul knew that these saints at Colossae loved the other saints. And if you remember, John on his letter said, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. So these are building up some important information here from Paul. He knows that these people have had an authentic moment in their lives when they put their trust in Jesus Christ. He knows that they have evidenced a love for the saints. There it is. Then he goes on in a little bit later on in that first chapter to say, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. The word of God had come to them, and they had heard it twice in the sentence. He says, they heard it. That means they've hearkened to it. It isn't just that they've heard it and thought, oh, this is interesting, this is nice, this is something I'd like to consider uh, at my leisure at some future point. This, this, they've heard this. They've taken notice of this. The word of God had come to them and they'd heard it. Faith, you remember, genuine, authentic faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God had come to them and they had heard it. And the consequence of that is faith. And then he says, they knew the grace of God in truth. Often in the New Testament, when you get the word truth, you cut legitimately substitute the word reality. So let's put it like this. They knew the grace of God in reality, not as a notion, not as an idea, not as an objective, not as something they aspired to, 
they knew the grace of God, the imparting of power to enable them to live differently. They knew that. He says, as you also learn from Epaphras, this is verses 7 and 8, our dear fellow servant who was a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also delay, declared to us your love in the Spirit. Later on, Paul was to write, the, the faith that we have doesn't need to be ashamed. And the reason we don't need to be ashamed and the reason we're not going to be embarrassed by our claims is because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And the love of God had been shed abroad in the hearts of these Colossian believers by the Holy Spirit. So Paul knew a lot about these people. He knew that they'd had an authentic experience. He knew that the consequence of that had been the bearing of fruit in their lives, transformed lives. He also knew that the love that they had for the saints was a love empowered and made possible by the Holy Spirit who had been poured forth in their hearts. These people, as all the New Testament church people, had had a personal encounter that the Bible refers to as receiving the Spirit or being baptized in the Spirit. So these are the kind of people that Paul is, that Paul is writing to at Colossae. He's never met them, but he knows a lot about them. And this is sufficient for Paul. He has no doubt that these are in Christ. If all that is true, there are some things that are true that they have not perhaps experienced personally, but they're just as true as if they had. And Paul will now reveal to them unknown, unknown. Things that are true that they didn't know about, hadn't even glimpsed possibly. But Paul knows they're true about them because he knows who these people are. They're people in the Spirit. They're people who are in Christ. And because they're in Christ, he can tell them something almost certainly that they didn't know about themselves. How is this going to be? Okay. Well, it's all kinds of things. It's, um, there's a whole section of it in Colossians. Um, and he'll say things like this. Uh, he says, giving thanks to the Father. This is verse 12. Who was qualified as? Did you know you had been qualified? If this is true of you, that the love of God has been poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit, and it's brought, God's work has brought forth fruit in you, okay, this is also true of you. You have been qualified to be partakers of the saints in an inheritance. <clears throat> and he's delivered you. I don't. Doesn't matter whether you feel it. Doesn't matter whether you had any outward circumstances that indicated it to you. <coughs> Excuse me. He has delivered you. He has delivered us. He includes himself. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. I don't know whether these people appreciated that they had been under an alien control, that they had been like the people of Israel under Pharaoh, under a cruel will that dominated their lives. But Paul is telling them, he says, you've been delivered from that. Not you will be delivered, not you are being delivered, you have been delivered from that. And you have been conveyed, the old King James Version says, translated. You've been translated. You've been moved from that kingdom into another kingdom. Again, not you're going to be. Not you are in process of being. You have been. You have passed from one thing into another. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You know, some Christians live a long time in that experience and don't know this. They don't know this revelation. That actually, if they're authentically God's children by this work of God's Spirit in their lives, then this is absolutely true of them whether they feel it or not, whether they understand it or not. They've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. They have redemption. There's a whole list of things here. And if you go on into um, later on into uh, chapter 3 you, and, and, uh, and 4, you'll, you'll see he, 
he keeps on talking about this is true of you, this is true of you, this is true of you. Now, the reason I wanted to stress this is, is this, because you should not try to induce an experience of having passed from death to life. You shouldn't try to induce or seek for an experience that can say, yes, I know when I was seated in the heavenly places. You don't need, you don't need any of that. You don't need any of that. Because it was all in Christ. And if God has put you into Christ, then this is true of you. For this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. You see, you need to know what God knows, so that an unknown, unknown, now becomes known. And as soon, <laughs> I'm not teasing you, I promise you, as soon as the unknown known becomes known, you become obliged to take account of it in the way in which you live your life. But it also comes with the power. It also comes with the enabling to live this new life that he has given to you. Paul prays here, it's very similar to his prayer that's written in the Ephesian letter, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, in order that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Not so that you get your theology right, that's important. But this is the real purpose, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Now then, do you believe that it is possible for a man or a woman that God helps to walk worthy of the Lord? Oh, I know you feel ever so humble and say, no, no, I'm a miserable. I'm never going to be any better. Do you believe that it's possible for you to walk worthy of the Lord? If it isn't, Paul has misled you. Do you believe it's possible to be fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God? Because Paul was praying for this. He did believe it. These things they will know by revelation. And we find them in this passage. Being qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Being delivered from the power of darkness. Being translated into the kingdom of the Son of his love. These things aren't experienced in the way that things touch you, that you taste. But they're revelation truth. But both kinds of knowledge will impact our behaviour. Some unconsciously, by instinct of the new life. And some by deliberate choice. Because you know you're no longer your own. And the life that you live, the life that you live, you live now by the faith of the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you. It all goes back to this. You say, oh, help, what did I do next? Here we go. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As you, therefore, have received Christ Jesus, so walk. In other words, the way that you began just continue, step by step. One step after another, so walk in him. This is not a giant leap into the unknown. As you have received Christ, and this is what receiving Christ means, not going through a form of response after an evangelistic meeting. Receiving Christ means receiving the Spirit who brings the life of Christ the inside. So walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it. Not just getting there by the skin of your teeth, but abounding in it with thanksgiving. What a gospel. And Paul, remember, had never met these people. What it must have been like for them to have this letter from Paul and do you know, I've discovered something about myself tonight. I'm qualified to take my part in the saints' inheritance. I've learned something about myself tonight. I've already passed from darkness into light. I've already 
discovered thee. Isn't it wonderful? The reason I like Colossians so much is because the Colossians were, are where we are. I've never met Paul, never seen him, never seen any of these extraordinary miracles that took place in the way that I'm here. He's writing to me as someone that he doesn't know. But if I know that I have believed in reality, I've received the grace of God in reality, that God has poured out the spirit of his love in my heart, I know that these things are true of me. for us God bless you thank you for joining us tonight I hope God willing Thursday night again at 7 o'clock next week same time same time